as we move through and as we move through today's presentation, I want to uh, remind what Helene said and ask please send any questions you have over the chat box either directly to her or in the uh, or in the group function on that. And she will be collecting the questions and we'll um, provide them to our presenters at the end of the presentations. Ms. Jody, I am turning the controls over to you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Brent, for that kind introduction. Can you can everyone hear me? I actually do some of my teaching on Collaborate, so I'm used to interacting with the chat box and smiley faces from my students. So I'm happy to be here today. I just wanted to briefly also thank Helene for facilitating the administration and setting all this up, as well, well as Dr. Tim Riles from the University of Tennessee, my uh, co-executive directors of the BMAS standards process, and Jessica Fox, who is his assistant there at the University of Tennessee. So today I'm going to be giving you, like Brent said, an introduction to a process that we like to call BMAS. That was our uh, clever acronym for um, a process aimed at um, continuing the standards development process from the former Council for Sustainable Biomass Production that I and many of the uh, folks that I'll mention here have collaborated in and the process that we're going to have moving forward. So let me see if I can move these slides. Great. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, some of the cornerstone principles of sustainability that we find in every basic type of standard that we have out there in land use, they typically cover, uh, let's say, four categories. The first set being environmental sustainability, soils, water, air, which can include um, greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity. We have the socioeconomics category, which in the United States typically refers to, refers to labor and employment conditions, but in an international context can also relate to community development and a, sort of a broader socioeconomic reach of, for example, biorefinery. Um, encompassing all of that would be the concept of integrated planning for all of those different areas. Also, at a baseline premise, the compliance with all existing laws and regulations. And then the last one, and perhaps the most important out of all of these, is the recognition, and this is recognized in the philosophy of the BMAS group, is the concept of setting baselines that are achievable that we can get at farmers, producers participating in as an on-ramp for continuous improvement from those baselines and uh, getting those constant feedback loops from their actions and the analytics that I'll show you relate to that, providing that feedback to allow for this concept of adaptively managing based on the conditions and the progression of continuous improvement. So those are the baseline principles of sustainability. I want to talk to you briefly about what is driving this whole conversation about standards and driving the whole um, conversation that we're having in the BMAS group. So one of the first drivers is a, basically a group of stakeholders in the world and a lot of people are coalescing around this. The court of public opinion is that when we use the term sustainable or bio or green, the environmental labeling, we need to have some type of verification behind that for the claim to be credible. And so the really the start of this in the bio, it was in the bioenergy context, although we've had in the United States organic standards for over a decade now, the start of this conversation was really back in the late 2000s in the European Union when they passed a directive called the EU RED or the Renewable Energy Directive. And embedded in Article 17 of that directive are a set of qualifiers for biomass-based liquid fuels for them to count toward Europe's 20% by 2020, their mandate for bioenergy. So liquid fuels, and this doesn't cover solid fuels like wood pellets to energy. It may in the future, and we can talk about that a bit near the end, but it covers liquid fuels, and for liquid fuels to qualify, there are a set of conditions in Article 17. For example, no conversion of high biodiverse lands where by law species are protected, like under the Endangered Species Act, high carbon stock lands because one of the 
great motivators behind bioenergy mandates to begin with is replacement of high GHG value fossil fuels with biofuels. And so they want to prevent the conversion of high carbon stock lands. This would be contrary to the sort of intent of the mandate to begin with. Also in Article 17 is a requirement for European producers to what we call cross-comply with the common agricultural policy. That contains agro-environmental measures such as compliance with the water directive, um, Natura 2000, or the sort of equivalent of our Endangered Species Act and species protection, and so on. So embedded in European Union a farm bill, we call it type policy, is a requirement that producers um, comply with agro-environmental measures. Um, for other producers outside of the European Union, member states are still required to report to the Commission regularly on the mandate's effects on those environmental principles and socioeconomic principles. As part of that reporting, if there is a, an imported fuel coming into the European Union, that member state would ask for that same type of let's call it cross-compliance, or in the spirit of cross-compliance, so they could do that type of reporting to the Commission. So in response to this, the EU Commission has recognized 15 certification systems. And I have a few of those listed here. They're not all-inclusive, but some of the leaders, at least in the US-based conversation, is number one, the International Sustainable and Carbon Certification. ISCC, which is uh, based out of Germany and has um, a lot of folks involved in the commodities, agricultural commodities businesses involved as stakeholders in that, not exclusively, but these are just generalizations about their sort of stakeholder makeup. We have the Roundtable for Sustainable Biomaterials that is SWIFT based and is um, led and supported by a lot of um, environmental civil society organizations. Um, it also recognizes FSC in the forestry context as a certifier for wood-based bioenergy. And then one of the third sort of leader in the world, and these are all international or world-based standards where they seek to apply these certifications not only in the United States but in other contexts as well. There's the Bon Sucro standard, and they're headquartered in London. Um, they do a lot of certification in Brazil and it's sugarcane based, although I do believe they have some certifications in Australia. They're not solely Brazil, but a lot of the effort um, started with certifications in Brazil. So of those 15, these are three of the ones that we talk about the most in the U.S. The dialogue about certification. Some of the other drivers outside of the European Union Renewable Energy Directive are aviation fuels because um, the European emissions trading system, there, I don't know if any of you saw this in the news, but there was a debate last year about whether American carriers would have to comply with the caps of the emissions trading system or cap and trading uh, Kyoto Protocol implementation in Europe for greenhouse gas reductions. The European Union agreed to withhold that application for a year while it's being negotiated in ICO about what type of biofuels will qualify and the carbon footprinting of that. So there's negotiations going on right now internationally about what a biojet fuel would mean. There were two efforts in the United States, the Midwestern Aviation Sustainable Biofuels Initiative and SAFIN in the Northwest. They both have reports online that you can access, whereas part of those reports and the studies that they convened is a recognition that BioJet would have to have some type of verification or certification for its sustainability, both carbon-based greenhouse gas emissions and other elements of socioeconomic and environmental sustainability. So that's definitely on the radar screen of aviation. There's also the new initiative between the Department of Defense and the Department, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and sorry, I don't have USDA mentioned on the slide, the Farm to Fleet initiative, where we know where there's been discussions about, well, what is a qualifying fuel and whether that would have to have a type of sustainability certification in the United States to qualify for that. And then lastly, there have been an emergence with a lot of what I call business-to-business 
not necessarily certification efforts, but uh, metrics efforts to gauge the sustainability of, for example, the Sustainability Consortium works with a lot of consumer products companies that supply to big retailers like Walmart to do life cycle analyses um, of all of the supply chain the lead at the consumer level versus the producer level. There's the field to market initiative, which has done some really uh, nice sort of mapping of indicators for U.S. agriculture and doing um, a, a tool that allows producers to sort of gauge trade-offs in a spider type diagram. Um, they don't offer certification though. And then recently we had WWF convene the Bioplastic Feedstocks Alliance, which is going to be exploring what type of metrics um, those that want to source renewable-based packaging, for example, for um, soft drinks or for consumer products, what type of metrics would apply to those. And we also have the Sustainable Purchasing Leadership Council that is procurement-based, and they actually are going to do they proposed a sort of lead type standard where procurement officials can look at like a color coded system, for example, a green, I suppose a green, yellow, red, or I don't know what sort of colors they're going to be using uh, or uh, indicators, but they'll be using some type of grading system for procurement officials to be able to use on what um, the performance of the products that they're buying are from a sustainability perspective. Now, missing all of all of this is, and this is sort of the specialty from which I and my collaborators come at this, are on the energy side of things. They do, they do life cycle footprinting of energy, but they're not sort of looking at energy as a product on its own, per se, within the procurement area or um, within sort of the biofuels context. Let me get to the next slide. There's also then as a driver too, and this has been more recently, um, efforts in different watersheds to reduce nitrogen pollution. So I divide this up into three areas of the country because there's um, three sort of different approaches there. And as an attorney, I often look at it from a litigation standpoint. But we have in the Chesapeake Bay, for example, already a nitrogen credit trading program in place in Virginia for agricultural producers to use. Um, we see that as a real opportunity for those of us that work in the biofuel space, um, forestry space, those types of perennial cropping systems that can be integrated into landscapes to be able to qualify for something like Virginia's uh, credit trading program. This is under challenge right now um, in the Third Circuit Court of Appeals by the American Farm Bureau Association challenging U.S. EPA's authority to set the TMDL in that area under the Clean Water Act. So we'll wait and see um, on the success of that litigation. But um, for right now, we're assuming in the Chesapeake there'll be these efforts to reduce non-point source pollution. The same holds true in Florida. There um, is ongoing litigation in that as to whether US EPA is required pursuant to a consent decree to impose numeric nutrient standards for Florida. Um, there's a current uh, notice of appeal pending in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals on whether or not EPA can unilaterally um, back away from a consent decree with environmental groups and let Florida go ahead on its own as a state doing its uh, nutrient standards. And then lastly and close to home for me at the University of Illinois is the Mississippi water, qual um, water quality issue. That's also the subject of litigation. Um, we had a district court decision in the Eastern District of Louisiana that said that US EPA needed to do formally a decision on whether to impose or whether numeric nutrient quality standards were required for the Mississippi watershed. Um, US EPA has appealed that to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and there's ongoing briefings about whether US EPA has discretion on whether or not to do that type of analysis on whether the Mississippi watershed needs US EPA mandated numerics. In parallel with that, we have something called the Stoner Memo that was sent to states within the Mississippi watershed that asked states to put in place in order to avoid a federalized system of uh, nutrient numerics, asked states to implement their own nutrient loss programs. 
And we see that uh, Iowa finalized theirs earlier last year. Illinois is in the process of um, issuing a draft this summer, which I've uh, participated in some of their meetings on that. But at, ultimately, whether it's US EPA or state, there is a trend towards setting numeric thresholds for nutrients in water bodies and being able to not only say we're implementing BMPs, best management practices in these watersheds, but verifying not only that they're in place, but verifying what sort of, sort of numeric outcome you're getting from those BMPs. And that ties directly into standard setting because often in standards, at least the legacy standards that we have, um, rely heavily on the concept of BMPs. And based on water quality um, policy and the movement toward um, cracking down on nutrient non-point source pollution, you see a lot of discussion about migrating toward more outcome-based metrics than just having BMPs in place. So this really poses both a challenge and an opportunity for bioenergy supply chains because the bioenergy industry is very nascent and is already struggling with getting their costs at par for fossil-based fuels. And on top of that, certification is expensive. It's expensive to run certification organizations, especially worldwide ones that take a lot of capacity. Um, a, a lot of sort of entities that would need certification uh, may find it cost prohibitive to do so. That's why you see not a lot of certifications in the United States. We do have organic certification as a model here, but um, we're not talking about making bioenergy um, organic certified. Um, the National Resource Conservation Service under USDA has a um, conservation planning program in place, but that doesn't offer the type of certification and verification that the sort of court of public opinion is asking for. And its planning is quite static in that a producer will get a plan and then that plan is in place for quite some time and it doesn't have those feedback loops in that we know we can get from complex analytics and big data to be to have them be able to update those plans. So that's sort of the challenge, but it's, there's also a really great opportunity. Um, and I think Dave moves this and emphasizes as well, is that looking sort of deeper into an operation um, gives you the opportunity to find inefficiencies and um, be more efficient and to save costs. And so that is, at least in the BMAS standards group, that's our first premise that we want certification to be affordable and accessible and lead to cost savings within the supply chain because that's what bioenergy really needs to be uh, or to foster and flourish in a bioeconomy. There's also the prospect, and you see this a lot in emerging conversations, you see them in grant calls, it's really renewed interest in ecosystem services markets whether it's for water quality, for example, in the Mississippi watershed, Chesapeake Bay, um, getting nutrient credit, credits for uh, putting best management and measurements in place, and also perhaps the uh, prospect of getting a carbon credit through the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard, for example, or in the future if there's an aviation biojet market, being able to qualify for that market and being and Along with that, though, having the producer being able to affordably meet that and uh, enjoy part of the pot of the price premium that you would have to have on a sustainably certified fuel. So BDAS is really, again, like I said, about reducing costs while at the same time keeping that credibility. Because oftentimes people imagine that if you reduce cost of certification, it can't be, it can't be credible, there's, there's corner cutting. So our goal is to really improve beyond just this sort of narrative social license to operate because as an attorney I know it's very easy to put aspirations in writing and write, you know, these codified standards of what we expect, 
which, okay, we could check boxes and say, okay, here's your social license to operate. But there's, like I said, this movement toward getting verifiable outcomes because of the concern about water quality, the concern about loss of biodiversity, wanting to know how much economic benefit is actually coming to the community from an operation, which could be a very positive story for bioenergy if we could get that verifiable outcome. Like I said, there's also this transition from BMPs, or at least using BMPs, but tying them to outcomes where possible. And this is where we know that we are generating through many of these awesome government-funded and private sector-funded research initiatives where we're getting the analytics. We've got tremendous sets of data, you know, probably first in the world, and really allowing us to aim for those more exact outcomes. We're really capable of that if we can put these pieces together. So it's that specialized knowledge that the BMAS group, the University of Tennessee, University of Illinois, realized that we would really like to capture for our U.S. stakeholders and being able to apply those to both the bioenergy supply chain, but that's not to say that they couldn't apply, in theory, to any type of land-based activity. So we want to incorporate all of those programs like AFRI and the, this IBIS-sponsored you know, webinar is one of those, um, Sun Grant, the Section 319 water quality programs that are funding water quality initiatives out there, um, the institute where I have an appointment at at the University of Illinois, the Energy Biosciences Institute, private sector efforts. We want to turn all of that research that at least I see in my EBI you know, group presentations, all of these awesome data that we're collecting in analytics, being able to convert that into a user-friendly tool for a U.S. producer or consumer to gauge their sustainability. And this would be a blueprint then for a systems level sustainability analysis, which is actually sort of the ultimate goal of a lot of initiatives right now, is to not only analyze by principle water quality, biodiversity, socioeconomics, but then in the end be able to have a sort of decision tool to be able to say, what are my trade-offs in this within a certification? And that would be part of that integrated management plan that a producer or consumer would do. There's one more element to this before we get into the actual tool side of that, and that is integrating ag and forestry together in standards. Because we know that forestry has a long, longer history of certification going back at least to the 1990s. The motivation of bringing forestry to the table to discuss with agriculture how we get these bioenergy certifications is at least threefold. The first is that there is a lot of skepticism about bioenergy in the world, whether it's food versus fuel or copious amounts of greenhouse gases being emitted from land use change. Um, and we would like to, as research universities, we see that a lot of the research that we do for whatever reason doesn't make it into the media as much as it should that shows the positive sides of bioenergy. So there, there needs to be a united voice um, that at least provides a balance against what has really been pervasive skepticism of bioenergy out there. Um, also trends in one influence another. So you have, for example, um, this idea of transitioning BMPs into more outcome-based measurements, um, but BMPs are prevalent both in forestry and in agriculture, but uh, in forestry in particular. And this idea of planning, because there's are, there is planning in forestry, not so much in agriculture, so there's a lot to learn um, from what the other is doing and uh, trends in the future for what will be done. There's also this trend um, toward more multifunctional diverse landscapes for either water quality, biodiversity, or we talk about this in my institute a lot, is um, mitigating supply chain risks when you base your whole supply chain on one crop that could be subject to drought or disease or other type of failures. So getting that more diverse, diversified cropping systems out into the landscape would necessarily demand not only perennial agricultural cropping, short rotation woody biomass, but also more forested applications, for example, in the Midwest. So this is a list of our collaborators, whether uh, more uh, passive observers or active collaborators 
in the process. I know that some of them are with us in the meeting today, and I really want to thank thank them for their um, continued sort of support um, in capacity building. There's a lot of learning that goes behind this in agriculture and forestry, so I really do thank our partners in this, but um, we're always seeking other collaborations. Um, we're particularly interested in getting um, to civil, civil society organizations that work more at the regional or local levels on the ground with people to see, um, to gauge the need for these types of tools and how we implement those. So thank you to those uh, collaborators. I want to be able to get to the bulk of the presentation, which is the uh, standards and tool building. And I'll save at the end sort of the conventional forestry side of what we're doing as well. I'm going to focus momentarily on ag and short rotation woody biomass standards and tool building. Um, like Brent said, this is building on the Council for Sustainable Biomass Production effort, which was NRCS, CIG funded. It submitted a report to USDA, and now this sort of would be the next step in well, refining the standards a bit based on you know conditions that we see today in the market, but um, also operationalizing or giving tools to implement that standard that's on paper. So we have a standard for produce, at the producer level. We'd like in parallel to do a consumer level. That would be the biorefinery or shed level standard. And the process that we're going through and have been going through through the last year is one where we translate those narrative standards into where we can outcome-based or numeric-based baselines. Then we have to translate that into a series of questions for the producer or the a consumer and a consumer standard to input data on what we call the front end. And then in parallel, we have to survey the universe of data sets and analytics that are out there on the back end that we could possibly use to auto-populate the front end for the producer to help them out and um, help on the producer front end side in answering some of those questions that would be responsive to a narrative that says, for example, um, uh, biomass production cannot negatively affect water quality. Well, what does that mean? That has to be translated, ideally, into some type of outcome that we can verify. And then, and this is key, and I'll show you a diagram here where we have the middle interface where the universities are not interested in being certification organizations. That's not their mission. Um, their mission is to support their stakeholders in agriculture and forestry. So we have in the middle an interface where certifiers, other certification organizations, or actually the actual certifiers themselves, supply chain managers, businesses as consumers of agricultural materials would go into the interface and being able to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with a producer on the front end and being able to choose the analytics on the back end to be able to satisfy what the BMAS standard has as a baseline. So I wanted to just um, show you part of this is a screenshot of where we're building that front end interface. Um, we would like to bring this into the Illinois National Center for Supercomputing Applications, which has experience in these types of web tool building, because these involve a lot of complex analytics, a lot of big data, and a lot of programming infrastructure to be able to put all of these together. So we've started to at least translate, and this is a soils example, where we translate the principle and then we have a series of questions where a producer would be able to choose either from a drop-down menu or based on other answers, it would auto-populate some of the types of information that we would want from a producer. Where is the field located? What are the baseline practices? Et cetera, et cetera. This is what the bottom of that page would look like. So we're building this and then also as part of this, and we don't have this in here yet, and this is where our folks who are experts in outreach like uh, Fred Ayuzzi from the uh, Illinois Biomass Working Group, Western Illinois, University of Illinois Extension, IBIS Extension, all the AFRI extensions coming together and being able to put materials into the front end, whether they're quick references, you know, short documents, or videos, eight-minute YouTube-like videos on, well, what is life cycle analysis? What is soil health? What is soil testing? 
all of putting, harnessing all of those really great resources into a one-stop shop for being able to get very accessible, understandable information. So that would be married to this. This is an example, and this is actually from Dave Agsol Solver Tool, where we would have the producer putting in the baseline type of information, whether it would be from a Google map that would answer, you know, what type of system are you using? We have the uh, GIS coordinates. Um, this would tell us the baseline of what is actually going on. Do you have an NRCS conservation plan? If so, you could attach it, and then we could work from there on what type of analytics we could further use to apply to that information. This is an example of sort of the exercise that I call front to back matching, for example, for greenhouse gases. Um, the CSBP actually did a uh, contract for a report from Lifecycle Associates where they recommended that we have this type of web tool where we have the farmers or producers being able to put in a series of answers about their yield, their fertilizer inputs, the type of uh, fuels that they're using, um, transportation. So we would be able to do this farm type survey. We would borrow from, at least on the fuels used in actual production, we could populate that from Argonne's Greet tool. And then we would apply on the back end, we would uh, apply a combination on the energy side of GREET and then we would have to decide based on field emissions how we were going to use GREET or DASENT or EPA's uh, modeling for the RFS. This is where it's really unique to have the research universities involved in this and all the AFRI and Sun Grant programs and those of us that work in soil carbon studies, for example, making sure that the most recent ones are um, integrated into these types of models so we're getting the most accurate information about field emissions that we can get. And this is a tool that doesn't yet uh, exist in the marketplace. So we'd like to be able to do that. I want to turn the floor over to Dave Muth of Ag Solver, a collaborator and friend of mine um, from Ames, Iowa, to give us an example of this front-to-back matching of how we would use a private sector tool of which Ag Solver is one of the leaders in providing. So Dave, I'm going to turn this over to you, and I will um, join then after you're done, Dave, and talk a bit about uh, forestry. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Please, anybody let me know if uh, there's any problem hearing me or they need to make any adjustments. I know there's some sort of fun things that happen to your, to your voice there towards the end, Jerry, so perhaps I sound sort of interesting to the group also here. I think it was because we both had the talk but not at the same time. Okay. <laughs> um, Oh, interesting. We may we may be uh, slightly out of date on the slides here, so we'll, we'll see. This uh, I think we got all the right information now. Um, Joey talked a little bit about architecture, uh, and I think there's some unique ideas flowing through with DMAS and the approach. And uh, you know, certainly the certification elements are the really important part. Uh, the engagement and the notion of continuous improvement are are really important in that actually expands, uh, even though it's a certification entity, it expands the business model and how uh, these pieces can come together and how they can actually provide value to the folks engaging them. And, <coughs> excuse me, as she mentioned, there is a wealth of existing tools, data sets, uh, workflows for um, assessing performance and improvement across uh, these different sectors. We're going to take you into a, an intensively managed Iowa uh, corn soybean kind of system and show some examples on a, a specific uh, sort of walkthrough going down the list of uh, some of the questions and some of the pieces of the BMAS standard with a, a very specific emphasis on soils, which is one that we've got a really good handle on uh, early on. Uh, yeah. So um, we're having a lot of people that are having a hard time hearing you. Um, so I don't know if you could talk just a little bit louder because they may be maxed out on their speakers with the software. But I just wanted to um, let you know about that. Okay. Is is that any better? I guess yes. maybe that is louder. Okay. Maybe it takes a little bit to get feedback from everybody. I will try and try and do so. Um, so. What we're going to do is sort of step into this case study that, that we've worked on. This is a field out of Iowa. You're going to see this come through a lot. 
And uh, what you'll see as we walk through this is the representation of the questions and the categories within the different soils and water components of the, the CSVP certification elements that are being carried forward as the base principles with BMAS. And the idea here is to, to show how uh, this wealth of um, existing tools, existing workflows, and existing precision data that's available can be leveraged into helping streamline the process of decision making and documentation around the standard, but also create an interesting opportunity for, to provide additional value um, along this continuous improvement spectrum. So just walking through here, the very first thing as we get in, uh, the question that's asked is, uh, do you assess and monitor the nutrient levels? Uh, right now, there's a lot of, it, it's a little bit variable across the uh, uh, primary row crop ag sector in terms of how closely folks are going to, to watch their nutrient levels. But what we see is there is a wealth of data uh, from various grid sampling and other kinds of mechanisms that help people with their fertility management plans. And so right on the back end of some of the tools and the architecture that Jody showed, we can create the ability to do things like upload the high resolution uh, maps. In this case, this field has fairly high resolution grid sampling and you can see uh, the phosphorus and the potassium levels in the soil with that last grid sampling piece. This is very easy and very straightforward way to get the kinds of documentation we can move through. Uh, it's very valuable too as we start to move forward. And this can, can sort of come back all the way to uh, uploaded PDFs or other sorts of more static data sources that can help document this, but it's places where we can streamline the information flow. And then as you sort of move through this soil nutrient and conservation planning uh, portion of the, the question set, you get into uh, how do you maintain soil productivity uh, and what is that, that sort of integrated plan that you pull in. This is again a place where we have very rich uh, machine generated data. Uh, in this case, you're seeing the, the maps that are pulled off of the machine for the as applied fertilizer data. The candid reality we face is that uh, this information is, is not used very extensively right now. Uh, and this is the kind of way, kind of information that we can streamline movement directly from equipment or uh, very easily through uh, some human interaction into the system as a key documentation. Um, with this sort of value proposition and um, continuous improvement concept in mind, we'll ask the question here uh, about when we look at these application maps, thinking about risk factors and nutrient efficiency, and this is something that we'll cycle through uh, where collecting and leveraging the information that we're pulling together as part of this documentation process can actually get us to a spot where we're uh, helping a, an individual that's participating make more money. So as we step into this a little bit further, uh, we see the protocols and the planning brought up by NRCS. And Jody mentioned NRCS. Um, they have built incredibly vast sets of tools and workflows and guides on how to do uh, a lot of these conservation planning types of activities. And this can be very fundamental to what we're trying to pull off. The key is, is that they're complicated. And in many cases, when you get into uh, the very explicit sort of mandated workflow components of it in the cases where, where it is mandated, uh, it, it requires a lot of hours in a field office. What we see though is uh, folks like ourselves and, and other folks out there can help streamline the process of moving some raw information about how a field is managed, um, coupled with a lot of publicly available data to create most of the components of an NRCS conservation planning report. In this case, what you see here, one of the key components using NRCS deployed tools that do this, uh, we quantify the, the soil erosion level across different um, soil types and soil regimes within the field. This is one of the, the handful of key elements that are required for this report. So uh, the idea is, is that upon getting the required information about the land management into the system, uh, we can streamline this process of getting to this critical piece of information uh, that's part of the, the certification. 
<clears throat> and then as we move through a little bit further, uh, we get to some of the nutrient management pieces. In this particular question, it's are nutrients managed to reduce loss to air and water? In Iowa, NRCS has created something called the Iowa Phosphorus Index. It's a tool that is used within a number of different workflows, ranging from conservation planning kinds of things all the way through to um, uh, manure management planning in the state of Iowa uh, to identify a key risk factor around phosphorus movement into watersheds. And it's index based, so basically you're getting a risk factor out. There's very similar tools. Uh, Minnesota leverages the NRCS developed water quality index. Uh, Illinois, Nebraska, Wisconsin, other folks have uh, deployed similar kinds of tools. This is readily available. And so we can again incorporate this and we can, without requiring a participant in the certification process to provide any additional information, we can start to get uh, required documentation in place and we can start to help them think about moving down that continuous improvement spectrum. One of the things we'll point out with this, looking at this field towards the bottom here, the higher P index is a higher risk profile for the loss of phosphorus. And just by overlaying that information with uh, the variable rate phosphorus application map that you see down here at the bottom, we can quickly start to identify uh, that we may have a problem that we have to deal with. And we'll kind of put that in the back pocket as we move forward through this. The next piece is um, getting into some more of this uh, comprehensive management planning and uh, it's focusing more on uh, the soil carbon as, a, as a, a metric for soil productivity. Again, this is a place where we can reference back to our NRCS conservation planning report that I mentioned we can basically do the key metrics in an automated way. This is another one of those key metrics, the soil conditioning index. Any number that's negative on here means that we're depleting soil carbon. If you're zero into positive, it means you are either maintaining or building soil carbon. Again, uh, another characteristic where we can take that information about how the land is managed, we can intersect it with the publicly available tools and massive data sets that are out there that USDA and others provide for us and create this outcome uh, without requiring any additional effort or making the process any more onerous. Now we're sort of moving into that biomass piece of this where uh, before we're looking at that management system as it exists now and in this case uh, we're starting to move towards a corn stover removal um, construct as our uh, biofuel and bioenergy um, uh, um, outcome. And so the question here on the residue is are we re retaining enough biomass for erosion control and the soil fertility pieces? So if we come back into the same sets of, of tools that we've, we've essentially provided through the framework, through the back end as Jody mentioned, and now we start to do something where we're pulling off about 1.8 tons per acre of corn silver, uh, fairly typical within some of the systems that we're seeing. Um, we can apply the methodology and now we see that we have pretty high soil loss levels. This is pretty informative. This is a piece where uh, we're getting into that decision support um, uh, kind of construct. And, and it's important as we push this forward a little bit more. One of the things we can do that with that is we can actually start to offer the ability to do prescription plans. So in the, the case of that last field, we saw, we identified that we had a problem, which we'll address here in just a second going forward. But you're providing a framework where, from the certification standpoint, where you can also come back and start to plug in tools and data sets that can allow you to um, give higher resolution prescription. This is getting into the piece where there's a very real economic value pr proposition associated with um, engaging the certification process. This is where we'd like to take this. And, uh, the, you know, the right place uh, and the right endpoints will, will evolve a little bit over time. But, but this is the idea of providing that value proposition and engaging that continuous improvement that you can start to see uh, from the framework approach. And then if we, we carry this forward a little bit more to the next question, we get into some soil compaction issues. Again, there's a wealth of public and private information that we can leverage into 
understanding and doing some documentation associated uh, with this question in, in a very automated way relative to, um, relative to the certification process. So let's get back to um, the, this field under the silver removal operation and we'll move to this erosion question in a little bit more detail. So the, the question really resolves around does the uh, NRCS score uh, fall less than the tolerable or T uh, uh, soil loss value for that field or for all the soils in the field. In, this, in the case of this farm, all of the soils have a a uh, tolerable soil loss value as established by NRCS of five tons per acre per year. What we see under the residue removal um, uh, practices that we implemented, we've got large parts of these fields that are uh, excessively exceeding uh, that soil loss level. We still have places where we're uh, within the bounds. Um, it's still pretty challenging when we're talking about these kinds of loss levels. So how do we facilitate thinking about this? It actually moves into the next question at the same time. Again, remembering all of this in the context of we're automating access to this information. Uh, the, the, the person working on the certification uh, has access to, to answer all of these questions and get these outcomes in a very automated way. So the question now becomes, do we apply the conservation practices and conservation systems? Well, we can, we can expose the ability to test something like a vegetative buffer conservation practice. Uh, in the lower right here, you see the result from an erosion standpoint prior, with, of course, with the residue removal practice, prior to the implementation of that conservation practice. And then the larger map here, we see that we uh, get quite a bit of improvement uh, on several of the soils that are starting to push us into compliance, uh, which is going to certainly be essential for certification. But we didn't quite get there, so maybe we'll go in and we'll uh, work on an additional conservation practice, in this case implementing a cover crop. And once we see this, now we've got an idea that, uh, okay, I've got a pathway for the improvement that lets me engage that biomass market where I can pull off an economically viable quantity of uh, corn silver and meet all of the certification principles that I need to, to work within. Similarly with soil organic carbon, uh, this, is, this is one where our grid sampling protocols that we see out there today, uh, we're actually getting organic matter uh, uh, results back and we've got a pretty good understanding of what's happening with organic matter. But again, we have to uh, uh, engage the processes that we have in place. Uh, falling back on some NRCS methodologies again, we've got a tool called the Soil Conditioning Index, which we can take the management system that we've got here and we can actually start to uh, work with it in an automated way where we can push it forward again. In this case, we've got this residue removal practice and in some cases we're in pretty good shape from a carbon standpoint even with those removal practices. In other cases, we're falling into the negative range where we, think, where we have to think about making some changes. Again, if we apply a vegetative buff, buffer practice, as a way to start to push this forward, we can see we've got some improvement. We're moving some of these numbers from uh, zero and slightly negative more into that positive realm. And going with a cover crop, we can make a significant change in moving that soil organic carbon trajectory forward. Um, this, is, this is where we're getting into some very uh, significant value propositions. If we take it to the next level and, and we start to look at water quality, uh, these pieces are of high interest and Jody highlighted uh, a number of the moving parts that we're seeing right now, nutrient reduction strategy in Iowa and similar efforts uh, in a lot of other places where uh, we're, we're working towards practices and implementation. What I, what I think is really interesting about this, <clears throat> the two maps on the left here, the top one is that uh, phosphorus levels from the soil grid sampling we saw earlier. The bottom one is the phosphorus application rate as it's administered on that field. This is a, essentially how we see precision ag work right now. Uh, you take the phosphorus levels, you set your uh, field targeted yield, and you put down the rate of phosphorus or other macronutrient as required um, to complete the mass balance, if you will, given that yield. The interesting thing when we look at these two in comparison is you, the only conclusion you can make given the information you have is that we have incredibly high yields 
where we have these high phosphorus application rates. But the reality is, is we've got really good yield data available in our uh, primary row crop agriculture. And over here you see a yield map, which is somewhat incomplete, but it tells us that we're actually not seeing uh, high yields. We're actually seeing fairly low yields in these areas where the phosphorus application rates were very high. And so that tells us that we've got, to, we've got to think about the loss factors. We come back to our Iowa phosphorus index, you can see that we're getting pretty high phosphorus, uh, P, excuse me, P index values in these same areas where the phosphorus application rate had to be high and our productivity pretty low. So what we've got here is we're getting the narrative that's coming together uh, that describes how to pull these disparate data sets together as part of the certification process. But the seamless outcome is that we can move quickly down this uh, value proposition and continuous improvement spectrum. Again, we apply our vegetative buffer practice and we can see that we've made a pretty big um, impact on our P index moving down. So we're going to be able to start to reduce that risk of phosphorus loss. And when we pull the cover crop piece in here, again, uh, we see how uh, we're saving money and improving our, our environmental performance at the same time. The beautiful thing that we see coming down the road too is uh, the publicly available information just continues to get better. In Iowa and some other Midwestern states we've got uh, full LIDAR information that is it's really high resolution slope data where we can actually start to solve the soil movement uh, questions in a very explicit, very high resolution way. Uh, and the outcome of that is saving money for uh, the folks with higher, efficient, higher efficiency in the use of the macronutrients, but also outcomes uh, around a cleaner environment. And I think at this point I'll turn it back over to you, Jody. Thanks, Dave. And let me know if you can't hear me well because I think we get a little bit of lag. But um, because I know we're, we're shortly closing in on our time left that we have, I'll go through this quickly. In addition to Dave's example of the tool that AgFolver that could provide, we also asked the question of all the different types of um, data that Dave was referring to, the analytics like Russell 2, SCI, and the reference to conservation planning. We've also then, as BMAS, went through and mapped and it's a complicated process of the what you see on your left-hand side, the actual standard, then we have to map what's called the CPA 52, which is the NRCS conservation plan. And in Iowa, for example, what type of tools, if you weren't going to use Ag Solvers tools, um, what would the type of tools would be available to you? And that would be incorporated into our front-end interface with a link to the back-end for producers and consumers to be able to tap right into that. Skip that. I want to just say a few words about forestry. Um, I know we have some of our uh, collaborators here at the tables, which I'm very grateful for their expertise and time that they've spent on this project, where we've discussed how, as a BMAS standard, um, we don't, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We know that in the field of forestry, there's a large legacy of forest certification, whether it's SFI, FSC, the ones in the United States. What we would like to do in anticipation of integrated landscapes in an agricultural context, um, being able to provide a service to those producers and consumers who want to be able to co-certify for ag and forestry. We have Tim Voke at SUNY ESF who we put him in the ag side of things. He's short rotation woody biomass. So that screen that you saw on CPA 52 and CPEE um, practice standards, Tim is isolating those that are there. Many of them aren't and we're incorporating that into our ag tool. On the conventional forestry side, we've done some research on trying to learn what are, which is what forestry certification is based in, the best management practices and the types of tools that they use for planning. So what we've done is 
researched all because they're all 50 different states and these are the BMPs that feed into the different forest certification standards of which BMAS then would be able to recognize if someone was certifying to uh, on, on the ag side but wanted to have the forestry side we would be able to say that well you can use SFI, FSC, these are the types of core sort of uh, practices or parts of the tools and data and analytics that we would want you to use, we can't make conventional forestry and ag the same because they're not the same. They're temporally not the same. The land's not the same. But to the extent that we can um, pin down the commonalities and get a sort of common uh, planning practice in place or at least a common understanding for the individual producer and consumer, that would be ideal. Um, so I think that that was actually my last slide. So in the future, moving forward, what we hope to do um, is one, this summer we'll have a um, website built. The one that we have right now is at biomasstoolbox.org. It's a shell website. A lot of what we are doing behind the scenes is not on there. It's in the presentation today. But by the end of the summer, have our website built. Um, we'll have our forestry side of things done. We'll have the matching at least to the mapping for Illinois and Iowa, hopefully getting Tennessee and New York where our case studies are, mapping all of those different existing types of tools, their analytics, their data, and then we anticipate hopefully getting some funding to be able to take this to another level, which requires quite a bit of funding to be able to do the computer programming to put these all together, but really hoping for the opportunity to do that, so like Dave emphasized, reducing costs, uh, getting verification that's credible, and also bringing many more people into the certification verification fold who actually would want to participate but for the lack of capacity. And so to the extent that we can um, form uh, relationships with existing certifications that want this type of capacity, um, we are looking forward to doing that and really providing that type of service to our U.S. stakeholders. And even if this blueprint could then be used um, throughout the world, because this type of architecture and developing this has taken a lot of time, of which, again, I'm very appreciative to our collaborators in thinking about in sort of moving this forward. It takes a large amount of capacity to do that. So I think with that, I will end and turn it back over to Brent. Um, if there are any questions or discussion, we'd be happy to participate in that. Thank you, Dr. Andrus and Dr. Mute. I appreciate your time. Uh, it's a lot of great work you've done up to this point, and I know there's a lot of opportunities out there. Uh, Helene, uh, have you been able to take some questions at this point? I know we're getting short on time, but uh, maybe we can take a few before we sign off today. Uh, yes, Brent. I got. I have two questions. So um, one was uh, sent to me earlier, and this is when you were talking about all the standards and requirements, um, like ISCC uh, for bioenergy. But the question is, um, are there any requirements and standards for gases fields? So this would be for biogas. I believe, and this would be something that if anyone knows more about the Roundtable for Sustainable Biomaterials, I thought that they were working on uh, pathways for that. There would be no reason why any of these standards couldn't have pathways for biogas. It would be the same type of footprinting from the front end, whether it's an agricultural crop or a residue or a waste, and then the end sort of production process, which would be biogas, and we can pro we can get those types of data and analytics from either the NREL processes or from greenhouse gas perspective, green, but I, there's a lot of interest in biomass, and that's something that we would like to, when we develop our consumer standards, like to be able to have that pathway. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, so what efforts are being made to protect private property rights uh, while offering these tools? I think the feedback's pretty bad. Brent, can you turn your microphone off, please? Okay, so I'm not sure if anyone, okay. everyone heard me correctly on that. Were you able to hear me, Jody? Yeah, I heard. 
So, so the question was efforts to protect private property rights, and that that's a great question. Um, and sort of the um, protecting information is at the forefront of what we do. Um, we one of the reasons why we brought this into the university facilitation was that we do have the capabilities of uh, one of the most secure databases in in the world and then being able to have a framework where that data is stored pursuant to agreement with and this the, the premise is that, that no one participates in this in a mandatory way. This is all voluntary. If you want to have that type of market access, that's what we call it, a market access standard, you participate voluntarily, but you actually would agree with the universities to be able to store your information there. It would be secure, it would not be released, it would be confidential, and then that middle interface would be where a producer and a consumer, a producer, consumer, and certifier, all would, outside of the university system, agree to how they would interface with the database, and then that that would be presented to the universities to allow release of that information. But there would be no part of this that would be outside of the consensual zone of the private parties that participate in this. Um, and Dave, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I know that you've spoken about only using, you know, the public side of information in this and how it relates to the USDA tools. I don't know if you want to add something, Dave, or not. Sure. Um, you know, a lot of what we do with this is pu using publicly available data that doesn't uh, sort of preclude the question, though. And I can say from personal experience, there's um, concern about quantifying certain characteristics of a production system. Say if you're sitting here in the middle of corn country in Iowa, um, how much do I really want information about the, the biodiversity question uh, or something along those lines uh, to make it out? So it's an absolutely important piece. Um, what we do see is that uh, with the publicly available data, we can get some pretty good uh, answers. And in that sense, um, you're not sort of infringing through there. Uh, all of the elements of uh, maintaining and utilizing privately provided data do have to meet the, the absolute maximum level of uh, security and protection. It's very sensitive and I know we as a company spend a lot of money making sure that we adhere to a lot of those standards and what we do and, and Jody sort of highlighted how they're trying to deploy the BMAS framework within that construct also. Um, there's absolutely uh, challenges not to be overlooked about uh, relating uh, potential outcomes or uh, even the perception of percent potential outcomes uh, for having some of these various criteria quantified though. And, and I think that uh, Jody and team are keeping that very, very much at the forefront. And I think that too speaks to a consumer level standard, which is a very valuable piece of standard setting where you have a consumer being able to aggregate this type of information, um, perhaps cleanse it of its more identifying elements, and being able to say within a watershed or in a diversity, biodiversity shed, to be able to say in aggregate, this is what we're achieving. Because we have to, we always try to approach this not naively, but thinking sort of positively in that there's not a lot of messaging right now about the benefits of what these systems could provide. And if a consumer could be the lead on that, always keeping in mind the confidentiality and the sensitivities to identifying information, but being able to use that in a positive way and say, we've achieved within our shed, our supply chain shed, this amount of gains in being able to prevent nutrient loss or habitat connectivity. That's a message that we as universities and as our collaborators want to be able to um, provide to the sort of social license to be able to operate that court of public opinion where we're showing at an aggregate level without the identifying information of what can be achieved. And that's why it's important once we get the producer side of it nailed down, which we really feel like we need to do just because we could provide that service at the field or subfield level of reducing inefficiencies. 
but then being able to migrate that up to a consumer level where it could be used in another context to say we should qualify as a biorefinery or as a type of consumer um, based on the benefits that we're providing, those producers that perhaps are not as far along on the on-ramp, um, but we have some who are overperformers, we could be able to adjust that in the aggregation process where the farmer that needs a little bit more education and outreach and help along the way could be given that while still participating, and then you have the farmers who are meeting that being able to help that biorefinery qualify at the shed level for an environmental improvement. So that, that's the best answer that I could give about private property rights, but we all, all of us in the collaboration in this, we have worked in the field of agriculture for a long time. A lot of us were raised in those areas, so we understand the concern about that and really respect that while at the same time wanting to give the positive messages that are absolutely there a voice. Great answer, um, Jenny. I think uh, your website, when you guys uh, have that finished at the, um, the end of the summer, would be really useful for you to uh, you know, receive comments from the public um, and also to provide information um, on you know where people can get information. And and I'm I'm looking forward to what you guys come up with. And you know I know you got it's a continuous uh, research and, and collaboration process. And I've enjoyed learning about all the tools that are available and and what you're going to be able to offer people, um, you know, consumers and producers. So I think that's very great. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day um, to participate in this webinar and provide a pre presentation. Both Jody and um, Dave did a great job. Brent, thank you for hosting. Uh, we are over our time. Um, I apologize for that. Um, if you're unable to um, hear maybe the beginning of this recording or having technical difficulties, it, it is recorded and it will be available. Um, on the website. So um, if you want to share it with the other friends as well, then you know that's the link right here on this page uh, where you can find um, this recorded webinar and also other uh, webinars in the series. So Brent, would you, um, I guess, do some closing remarks or 